Welcome to 52 Miniatures, my name is Alex. Today we'll be painting a lovely 32 year old Warhammer Orc Champion because I'm a grumpy old man and I think it looks way cooler than the new old world Warhammer Orc Champion. A bit more of a step by step painting guide this time. Uh, orc skin, lovely saffron yellow and so another epic tale from the hobby realm. <laughs> In my bunker, I have this magic box filled with memories from a distant past. Not quite like having skeletons in the closet. Admittedly, there are some lovely skeletons in the box, but they were already dead when I bought them. This box sure takes me back. I'd kind of forgotten about it, but now that the Warhammer old world has returned, so has the box. A chance to paint some old minis from times of static poses with gigantic hands on square bases. Today we're picking out this fierce looking orc champion from 1992. I'm not nostalgic with these paint jobs, the memories of stirring humbrol paints with toothpicks that break in half and fall into the pot are firmly lodged in my brain, regardless of thinner. And that's enough for me. And so into the bio strip she goes, the best paint stripper for plastic or metal I've worked with to date. The thing is, I saw a picture of the new Orc champion for the new old world. Uh, by the way, if you're new to Warhammer, this all probably sounds confusing. The Warhammer Fantasy tabletop wargame was around when I was young. It kind of bloated itself into quite the beast. Many minis were needed. The entry level was high. I guess no money was made, so the game eventually got scrapped and was replaced by Age of Sigma. Games Workshop has now, I think about 10 years later, repolished and re-released Warhammer Fantasy. But it's now called The Old World. 10 years is actually not much in the grand scheme of things, but yeah, most of the models are a lot older than that. The bases are square because that's the thing with this game. You mainly play with many miniatures in set large formations, not moving the models individually. So-called rank and flank. Kind of like Napoleonics or something, but with bitey goblins and that. You would have noticed the classic I'm holding a big weapon over my head in a very threatening manner pose. Typical of the time. This, I guess, is because you can't really have bits of the mini sticking out past the edge of the base, as it would then not be able to fit into a rank of many similar minis. So in a way, how the game plays did quite affect the look and style of the miniatures. Scornful as it may seem, the new orc champion, I guess they're called bosses nowadays, did not tickle my fancy. Don't get me wrong, the new stuff looks nice, I just don't think it looks the part. I'm nostalgic. The new orc looks too new for me. Wave that axe over your head, darn it. And so today, I want to shine a light of nostalgia on this battled old orc. Bring it back to glory so that it can venture forth and fight the new flashy orc for supremacy. It's the orc way. Besides, it threatened to eat all the other minis in the box if it didn't get a new coat of yellow paint on its armor. So you know, my hands are tied. But let's start with the orc skin. After scraping mold lines and pimping up the base, I primed the miniature black with a rattle can. I've done several videos on green skins, one in particular on how to paint a more diverse crowd, not only green, linked above. But today I want to go for that rather classic muted green orc skin tone. I'm using fallen grass from Chimera as my base orc skin color. Don't get scared about the fancy paint. I think pretty much every paint range out there has an orc skin tone quite like this paint. To achieve some darker tones, I'm going to mix in violet. Any violet will do. You can also experiment with other colors. A red mixed with the green will render something more brown, for example. I'm layering on pretty thick. The paints have been watered down a little, but I'm just trying to cover all the black with as little fuss as possible. Blending in the colder violet mix in all the areas I want shaded, like under the arms and recesses in that. I then go in again with a second layer of fallen grass, rather thin, to bring up the mid-tones again, avoiding all the recesses and most areas facing down towards the base. Next step is another forest color. 
Sherwood Green. It's rather Robin Hood, right? So look for a Robin Hood color among your paints. And a lovely little paint explosion there. What a waste. I mixed this with some of the previous green, thinned with water, and started working up the skin. The overall technique is to add brighter and brighter paints going from cold shadows to warmer highlights. Painting on each consecutive layer on smaller areas, achieving depth and gradients and structure in the skin. I work my way up to a pure Sherwood green and then I'm going to leave it for now. So let's start with that yellow or saffron or mustard if you will. Just not French mustard. Lovely stuff on a sandwich but too grey for orc armor. To get a jump up from black I'm covering all parts to become yellow with this rusty colour. This exact shade is not really important. I just picked a paint I know covers rather well. A warm mid brown or something would also do the trick. The yellow I'm about to do is the same I used on my recent Stormcast video linked above. And I've been getting requests on a more specific tutorial on how to paint the yellow. Some even ask if they need to join my Patreon to get it. And of course not, you shouldn't have to pay for it. But the Patreon is what keeps this channel afloat. Seriously, if you would consider checking out the Patreon I'd be honoured. It would be great to actually get a salary from the work put into this channel but there is still a long way to go. Either way, please like the video and leave a comment. That really helps and I really appreciate hearing your thoughts. The base for the yellow is Yellow Iron Oxide, a single pigment paint. I'm using Golden So Flat. I know Chimera makes one as well, as well as other artist paint ranges. In miniature paint it's difficult to find equivalents as they don't specify what pigments are in the paints and then give them cool names. But you're probably looking for something like Tau Light Ochre from Games Workshop, a warm earthy colour. After getting a solid covering layer of this it's time to shade it down using a dark purple brown and a sort of grey teal colour. Exact paints are not important, it's all about the attitude man. Get a little brown in a purple and probably any teal or turquoise with a bit of grey in it and experiment. I thin these paints down immensely with water and some medium. My contrast medium was handy so I used that. A medium is essentially paint without colour or slash pigment in it. It thins the paint but lets it keep some of the properties of paint. I paint this on in all the recesses and surfaces facing down, mainly the purple but also sometimes the teal for variation. After applying paint I quickly clean my brush in water, whisk off excess water and go back and try and smudge out any stark lines, erasing them with a moist brush to a sort of gradient. This could probably be called glazing. If you really thin the paint down applying layer after layer or if you do thicker more violent attacks like me it's just personal preference. On the whole it's kind of like adding a wash but only in the recesses. A wash that doesn't darken much instead just changes the colour. I've now got a great shading going that contrasts the yellow in a lovely way and the orc skin. Now it's just a matter of working up the yellow in thin layers of brighter and brighter paint leaving the darker tinted stuff in the recesses alone. I use an excessively warm yellow, it's almost like gold, and a regular warm yellow. Anything not too lemony. First layer is a mix of those two paints and some of the original oxide, about one part of each paint. We're essentially going for a warmer and slightly brighter version of the base iron oxide. Just look at that great mustard vibe. I then add more sun yellow to the mix and take another pass, yet mindful of covering less areas than before, sort of creating gradients from dark to bright. A great thing about yellow paints, as well as why they're sometimes a nuisance, is that they're rather transparent. But if the base is right, layering them on is rather nice. Slowly building up the yellow in a gradient looks rather smooth in the end because of the paint's transparent nature. One last pass with even more sun yellow, probably almost pure sun yellow by now on only the most raised bits. The kind of stuff that would catch the light from a sky kind of a thing. I mean we're pretty much doing the exact same thing as on the orc skin, layering and layering again. And there we are, still missing some final highlights but as with the skin I'm saving that for the end. For those of you that requested this I hope this was helpful. I was not sure where to go next with the plate armor and mighty axe. There's a pretty nice palette going here but for some inspiration I decided to go look at some old Warhammer paint jobs. 
I don't have an old greenskin book, but there's some army pictures in this dwarf faction book, and some great looking paint jobs on the back of Warhammer Quest. I sure wish I had all those old white dwarf magazines somewhere, but they've been lost through the ages. I'm surprised at the many colors used. Bright colors too. Excellent gaming pieces. And there sure is a lot of red and oranges going. I mean, I know orcs like red, orange and yellow, but this monster rider is pretty freaked out. So I decided for orange. It could be rust, it could be copper-ish, whatever. Some kind of muted orcish orange to go with the yellow and green skin. Just put orc or orcish in front of whatever you're doing and it works great with any orc scheme. I started out with the same dark purple used in the glazing on the yellow and work my way past the brown up to a rust red. The purple is a nice place to start for a rusty orange, but it also gives a similar vibe to the whole miniature. Throughout this paint job, I continued to use this purple on almost all shadow areas. Using a little of a specific paint in the other paints, or glazed on like I also did here on the axe to push through a bit more purple, is a great way to get a coherent feel to a paint job. It doesn't have to be purple, but usually for shadows, a cooler color is a good place to start. As you can see, I'm going for a sort of scratched, worn look, trying to be a bit imaginative and thinking of textures and scratches, especially on the blade. With that last layer of Mars orange, it's starting to look quite interesting and almost like a metallic of some sort. My first encounter with orcs was of course reading The Hobbit. I think my dad read it to me the first time, but I've read it several times since and only just recently started reading it again. Written by J.R.R. Tolkien and first published in 1937. Many of you would have read it, but if you haven't read it or listened to it recently, or not at all, I'd thoroughly recommend it. Not only is it the introduction to the world that is Middle-earth and thus the Lord of the Rings to come, the foundation of high fantasy as we know it. It's also a lovely tale. It's a book for a younger audience, not as dark or complex as the coming trilogy, but The Hobbit is a wonderful story with a matter-of-fact style that I find some fantasy lacking. Letting our own imaginations fill the story rather than over-explained settings and in-detailed fight scenes. There and Back Again is in many ways the perfect description of this tale. In The Hobbit we encounter goblins. The word orc is mentioned a few times. Many an hour in the deeper recesses of the internet can be spent arguing if these, in this case, are the same thing. I believe they are. Are they green-skinned? Who knows? There's no detailed description in The Hobbit. They're ugly and mean, carrying curved blades, whip their captives and occasionally ride wolves. In a way, the embodiment of bad and evil. We all need a protagonist to make the rest of the pack look better. So I feel a little sorry for them. I mean, some of the dwarves and elves in the book aren't always the most enlightened characters either. Admittedly, torture is maybe not a preferable hobby in the grand scheme of things, but I'd cut them some slack. If you've only seen the films, I definitely recommend you read or listen to an audiobook of The Hobbit. The Hobbit films are cool action films, but a vast change from the original. Grumpy sentimentalist here. That's why we're painting an orc, remember? There are no major action scenes in the books. For example, the epic last battle that is like two hours of film is mere ten pages in the book. The first encounter with goblins and the big boss great goblin is not more than five or six pages. So for a lovely story and a first encounter with Middle Earth, give the Hobbit book a try. For the metallics, I decided to go for a brushed steel, sort of non-metallic metal. Non-metallic metal, or NMM, is essentially painting metals with regular paints but trying to get the reflections right so that when done properly, things actually look like metal. This requires a bit of brush practice and knowledge in how light would reflect from different geometrical shapes that build up the armor. I'm not quite there yet. Instead, I go for my not-quite NMM. The whatever looks cool approach. I start with a dark cool grey mixed with black and cover almost everything apart from the very deepest recesses and areas I figured would be in shadow. I've mixed my three paints, black, cool dark grey and a warmer light grey into five shades. 
For me, using a wet palette is great at all times, but on occasions like this, it's beyond great. I can move back and forth between darker and brighter paints, erasing mistakes along the way whilst mixing different shades when more than my five steps are needed. Constantly, I'm sort of trying to think of what parts would shine more, but also go for experimentation, adding highlights where I think it just might look cool. After I'm about halfway to my highlights, I thin down the black to a glaze using water and a little contrast medium. Again, a very thin paint that I use to bring back some of the shadows. Like previously with the purple, smoothing out the edges of the added paint with a moist brush, giving me some sort of smoothish gradients and darker shading. I can then go in and apply the final highlights with brighter and brighter paints until I get a nice shiny effect. Going for a scratched beaten up armor is a lovely quote shortcut unquote. Staying away from smooth lets me get away with scratches as highlights. For me it's a lot simpler and thus more fun. Still I know it looks fiddly and quite a few steps away from a layer of metallic paint with a wash on top. But it feels like every time I do it it's rewarding and so I just keep coming back to it. We paint for different reasons. I won't bore you too much with the surplus details. I was a bit insecure as what to do with them, all the little details everywhere, but eventually decided to go for lots of shades of brown. A brown rainbow, if you will, for belts, pouches, fur and such. Sticking to a lot of warm browns reminiscent of the good old snake bite leather I used as a kid. This mini is rather busy for its time. All in all, I'm trying to get a slight retro vibe with this paint job, a kind of even relatively bright miniature without excess shading and such. A contrast to the more moody, grim and dark style I tend to explore. So instead of any darker washes, I mainly use that dark purple throughout the paint job as a shade to all my browns. Remembering the colourful picture in the old Warhammer books, I indulged in one more splash of colour, admittedly a rather modern magenta or pink if you will. The scabbard was the perfect spot to add a little sparkle of interest and magenta would be a great contrasting colour to everything else done so far. Again shading with that darn purple, getting a bit tiresome hearing that perhaps, but it's a neat trick worth trying out, binding all the colours on the mini together with a common nominator. This is now the stage where I can make some more informed decisions on how much highlights I need on the yellow armour, the orange and the orc skin. I want to make sure I don't get it too bright compared to the shine on the brushed metal helmet, but sure, everything needs a bit more bite in the highlight region. I leveled up the skin with a fall green, another forest themed paint, with a bit of pale yellow mixed in. Creating some textures and lines on that lovely face, but also touching up all the raised bits, making them pop a bit more. While at it, I realized we need some alluring lips. I'd kind of forgotten about them. Again, pink will be a nice contrast. I start with a paint called sandalwood, a great paint. Kind of like a Caucasian skin tone, but not very warm, a favorite for sure. This I can then stain with thin down pink and magenta. That way I get a sort of neutral transition from green that I can then stain in places with some pink, instead of like a sharp line between pink and green. Rather lovely in my opinion. All orcs, of course, have beady menacing red eyes. At least back in the good old days, and so, again, my hands are tied. Red eyes with a tiny dot of pale yellow to give it that slightly mad look of someone you most definitely don't want to cheat in poker. The orange looked dull now, compared to the steel, and so this was probably the final decision of turning it into something more like copper rather than rust. Adding a very pale yellow orange, a mix of my final orange and some bright and pale yellow, in choice places where the metallic would bling. Hopefully blinding any elven archers in that thicket over there, waves axe with vengeance. And finally, some choice highlights on the yellow, using my soul flat bismuth vanadate yellow, fancy name that. It's rather pale and bright, I add this sparsely, more like adding scratches than trying to get any smooth highlights. And the orc is done. Well, the shield needs gluing on and the base needs some paint. I won't bore you with that, not for the base at least. But as you can see, I've been painting the shield alongside everything else. Another spot of stylish yellow. In retrospect, I wondered if maybe the same magenta as on the scabbard would have worked out better. But then again, I'm enjoying the coherent look. Who knows? The orc seems happy at least, so I better leave it or it might take my finger off. 
I then varnished with the polyurethane varnish and after that was dry another layer of AK Ultra Matte Varnish. Adding a few coats of varnish on metal miniatures is a great idea to protect the paint from battlefield damage. Especially polyurethane varnish which I find quite durable. If we have a look at the paints used on this little friend, well first off, there's lots of them. I kind of splash out because I have all this stuff at hand. My pile of shame is more of a puddle of distress. At least it would be if I poured all the paints into a puddle. So I feel like I should use them, you know. Anyway, we have a pretty coherent colour selection going. With all them paints looking rather nice next to each other. Looking at paints like this, especially before painting, can be a nice way of building up a scheme. Or try painting them up on a piece of paper to get an idea of where you want to go and what might work. I now have a happy orc, if orcs can be happy. I guess when they get to whip little hobbits and ride wolves in the full moon. The wind flapping against their huge 90s hands and face. Moonlight glinting off the constantly overhead axe. What do you think? Old orc for the win? Or am I just being a sentimental fool? I'm a happy sentimental fool at least because painting this was fun. And I'm looking forward to opening that box of memories again and maybe slapping paint on some more old minis. Praised be the bandwagon. At least when it doesn't have too many space marines in it. Thank you for watching. Please like and subscribe for more epic tales from the hobby realm. Bye. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm.